Hello, and welcome to the latest webinar in our 2020 webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, Where Does Power Over Ethernet Make Sense? If you've not yet had a chance to check out the lineup, you can do so at AppliedMotion.com. I'm pleased to introduce today's panelist, Eric Rice. Eric graduated with a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and joined Applied Motion Products as an application engineer in 1997. He has worked in the motion control industry for over 20 years, specializing in step motors, servo motors, drives, and controls. During Eric's presentation, please submit any questions that come up in the webinar control panel, and at the end of the presentation, we'll have time for a little Q&A. If there are more questions than we have time for, we'll follow up with you individually after the webinar. And with that housekeeping out of the way, over to you, Eric. Thanks, Mike, and thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. As Mike mentioned, I'll be covering an overview of our integrated motor solution for power over Ethernet, also known as PoE. Uh, PoE is a method for supplying power to a device over the same standard Ethernet cable that communications are being sent and received. PoE is actually a series of standards developed by the IEEE, and those standards cover different power ratings for different kinds of devices. In a previous webinar this year, I went into some detail about what PoE is and the different IEEE standards that are available. If you'd like to learn more about those topics, I suggest you check out the webinar recording. You can find it on our YouTube channel. We also have some reference material about what is PoE on our website, if you prefer to read uh, than watch. And in the email I will send to everyone following this webinar, I will include links to the video recording of that previous webinar, as well as the additional resources on our website. So I'm not gonna be going into a lot of background on PoE standards today. For today, the main thing to note is that the flavor of PoE that we're talking about is known as IEEE 802.3AT type two, or more commonly referred to as PoE+. Now, PoE+, delivers up to 30 watts per port using standard Ethernet cable. And because PoE uses standard Ethernet cable, and by the way, we recommend Category 6 cable for most installations, the only things you need to take advantage of PoE are compatible devices on both of the network connection. So on the power supply side, you'll have an injector or a switch. And on the device side, you'll have a TSM-14 PoE step servo integrated motor. We'll talk more about injectors and switches in a bit, uh, but for now, I'd like to focus on the integrated motor. The 30 watts available from a PoE Plus port is enough to max out the speed and torque of a NEMA 14 frame step motor. So what we have here is this integrated motor that's built around a NEMA 14 frame step motor. It has an integrated encoder, an integrated drive with a built-in motor controller, and closed loop servo control firmware. We refer to closed loop servo control as step servo. So when you hear us talking about step servo in our products, we're talking about a step motor that we drive like a servo motor. To understand where it makes sense, uh, sorry. Sorry, to understand where it makes sense to use this motor as a motion control solution, let's review the basics. Um, as I just mentioned, it's a NEMA 14 frame step motor and it's controlled step servo, closed loop. It's integrated because all of the drive electronics are built into the motor housing. You only have to apply a DC power to the motor. That's the only um, requirement. And in this case, it's going to be DC power over ethernet. Uh, and no other external motor controller is required. Everything else is built into the integrated motor. It's built for ethernet networks. That may go without saying, but I'll add it here anyway at the risk of sounding obvious. Um, if, if you don't have ethernet, it's gonna be hard to use this. Uh, the motor supports common industrial ethernet protocols such as ethernet IP, Modbus, and of course our own proprietary serial command language or SCL, 
which is an easy to use and very functional um, command language for streaming commands over Ethernet. The motor is also able to run stored programs that are created with our Q programming language. Q programming is a powerful uh, set of commands. Uh, it basically takes the serial command language and puts those in program form so that you can store motion profiles in memory on the motor. Uh, it provides numerous benefits for the user, not the least of which is being able to offload motion path generation and positioning tasks to the motor, which lightens up and simplifies the programming efforts in the PLC or your other Ethernet controller. There is only one connector on the motor. This is for the PoE Plus connection, and there are no discrete inputs or outputs on the motor. And then finally, you'll need a compatible Ethernet switch or injector with an available PoE Plus port. What about motor performance? This slide shows the speed torque curve for the motor. The torque, uh, the torque available from this motor allows it to be used in place of any small step motor up to and including NEMA 14 frame size, of course. But because of its closed loop performance, it can also replace some smaller NEMA 17 frame step motors, especially those NEMA 17 frame motors that are being controlled open loop. And that's because of the benefits of closed loop control that we get with the NEMA 14 motor. Like any step motor system, you can see that the torque drops off as the speed increases, such that the motor provides the most torque in the low speed range. Unlike conventional step motors, though, that are driven open loop, the closed loop TSM-14 provi provides full continuous torque, which is the dark blue line. And then it provides an additional peak torque range at the low end, which generally translates to faster acceleration and deceleration. And the peak torque there is indicated by that light blue line. As far as sizing this motor, the process is the same as with any other step or servo motor. You need to take into consideration not only torque and speed, but inertia. Uh, when, when sizing step and servo motors, we talk a lot about reflected inertia or total system inertia. Basically, what we mean is the total inertia of the load as seen by the motor. That means everything connected to the motor shaft. It includes the inertia of the payload itself and the payload inertia as it's reflected through the mechanical linkages between the payload and the motor shaft, as well as the inertia value of all the various mechanical linkages themselves. The process for calculating total inertia of the load is pretty straightforward and completely depends on what the motor is moving, whether that be a direct drive, as shown in the picture here, with this kind of symbolic representation of the load as a cylinder, uh, whether it's a linear actuator, whether it's a timing belt and pulley arrangement, et cetera. All of those are going to affect the calculations for inertia. Um, this, this presentation is not about those specific application uh, calculations for inertia. Um, but rest assured, if you don't know where to find them uh, or don't know how to calculate inertia, we're here, we're here to help you. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to our application engineers who do this day in and day out, uh, sizing loads, uh, sizing motors for various loads. Ultimately, in terms of inertia, we want the ratio of the total load inertia to the motor inertia, uh, also, which is commonly referred to as the inertia mismatch, is that we want the, the load inertia to be no more than 10 times greater than the motor inertia, which we would call a 10 to one inertia mismatch. So that little thumb on this screen is indicating that an inertia mismatch of 10 to one or less is an excellent rule of thumb. It's very possible and it happens very frequently that motors can control a load with a higher inertia mismatch, but staying within that 10 to one range will always make your life a lot easier. The motor will be able to accurately control the load during XL, decel, and while holding position, and you'll likely avoid a range of other potential headaches as well, such as difficulty in tuning the system or handling the load during maximum deceleration. Basically, stay within the 10 to 1 
and life will be good. So what do you do if the mismatch is greater than 10 to 1? Enter planetary gearheads. Planetary gearheads are a great accessory for any motion control axis, particularly rotary loads, uh, conveyors, belt actuators, timing belts and pulleys. And gearheads primarily function in three ways. First, they reduce the speed, and simply the speed is reduced by the gear ratio. Second, they increase torque. The torque of the motor is increased by the gear ratio times the gearhead efficiency. And with planetary gearheads, it's typically going to be a 90% efficient or in the 80s, maybe. And then thirdly, which not everybody realizes, is that uh, the gearhead ratio also decreases that inertia mismatch. And it decreases it by the square of the gear ratio. So we're trying to get down to 10 to 1 or better. If we start at you know, a 50 to one or a 100 to one a mismatch. It's very simple by using a five to one or 10 to one gearhead or something in between there to get that inertia mismatch down into a manageable ratio. Uh, so a five to one, just to be clear, a five to one gear ratio would decrease that inertia mismatch by 25 times. So they really come in handy. Um, there is of course a trade-off for using them. You get a lot more torque but the speed decreases. So this slide shows the same speed torque curve I showed a couple slides ago, but with various gearhead ratios applied to the base torque data. The base uh, or motor only torque data is the blue line down at the bottom, uh, the dark blue and light blue down there at the bottom. Of the, I don't even know if you can see that, but you can see hopefully in this uh, slide that as the ratio of the gearhead increases, the torque available from the motor also increases, and at the same time, the max speed of the motor decreases. Um, I had a feeling this might be a little hard to see, so I, the dotted red line there between zero and five revs per second, or zero and 300 RPM, I blew it up here on this slide. So this, slows, this slide shows that same speed torque data just in a narrower speed range for greater detail. Uh, the takeaway here is that depending on the speed you need to run, you can increase the output torque of the motor significantly and control much larger loads if you incorporate a uh, planetary gearhead into the axis. Regarding linear applications, for example, or specifically with lead and ball screw actuators, the motor usually will be directly coupled to the screw meaning no gear head in the system. And that's because the screw in the actuator already has an inherent gear ratio or reduction ratio built into it uh, by means of the threads on the screw. This mechanical advantage uh, reduces the inertia of the load in the same way that a gear head does, uh, also with the same trade-off of speed. In this slide, we've got another set of performance curves. But what I've done here is convert torque from the motor to force of a theoretical screw using different lead lengths of one, five, and 10 millimeters. So uh, the lead of a screw is defined as the amount of travel per rotation of the screw. So a five millimeter lead will produce five millimeters of travel for every one rotation of the screw. Um, I say theoretical force values because many actuators have maximum force limitations either due to the bearings or the nut designed into the actuator and these curves don't take into account any of those real world limitations so the data here is just for reference only but the intended takeaway is that with a uh, proper choice in lead length for a given linear application this small NEMA 14 frame motor has the potential to generate quite a bit of force and similar to gearheads, there's going to be a trade-off between force and speed. So where are people using the TSM 14 POAE integrated motor today? Well, customers and uh, current customers and early adopters of this motor have had several things in common. First, uh, their applications are a good fit for the performance available from this closed loop NEMA 14 frame motor. Um, you know, the, part of the reason I'm focusing a, a little bit on the performance of the motor is like, is that in many of our product lines, we have a range of motor sizes. So for example, if you say 
uh, you just need Ethernet IP. We've got a whole slew of products for servo, integrated motors, non-integrated, that have Ethernet IP built in. And so we have quite a range of motors to offer you. In this particular case, because of the limitations of PoE, it's just the NEMA 14 frame. So obviously, the performance has to match. Second, most of the customers that uh, are using this motor were already using Ethernet communications, and most of them were also already using some PoE devices. And finally, all of these applications, early applications, uh, are where a single cable to the motor has been particularly advantageous uh, due to either difficulties in mounting and wiring a power supply or routing cables around existing equipment or, or similar scenarios. So some examples of industry segments that have adopted this motor already, uh, life sciences, material handling, lab automation, electronics assembly, mobile robotics, and some of the exa uh, specific examples in those industry segments are here as well, valve controls, end effectors on robotic uh, arms, and electric grippers as a type of end effector, uh, part rotation and orientation, clamping, and then of course positioning and velocity control. Okay, shifting gears a little bit, now I'd like to talk about injectors and switches. For anyone who isn't using PoE already and would like to incorporate this motor into a project, one easy solution is to purchase this injector from us. The injector part number is 10382, and this injector simply plugs into a 120 volt outlet and provides two Ethernet ports. The first port is a non powered port. That's for connecting your computer during configuration uh, and your PLC or Ethernet controller um, that you're going to use to, along with the motor. And then the second port is the one that's powered for connecting to the motor. And it's called an injector because it literally injects DC power over the Ethernet connection to the motor. It doesn't affect, it doesn't have any other effect on the Ethernet connection at all. And uh, we found that this injector works great on the bench uh, during configuration and setup, but it can also easily be a part of your permanent installation in the system. What we found uh, in practice is that many users will opt to choose a switch over an injector, and that might have something to do with the rapidly growing selection of industrial PoE devices, meaning if you're using PoE on one device, you, you're probably looking at it on other devices. Um, so if you're planning to use our P, uh, PoE motor, you should do that. You should consider other POD, uh, PoE devices, I would say. Uh, when selecting a switch or reviewing a switch you already own to ensure compatibility with our motor, you want to look for these three identifiers. PoE plus, 30 watts per port, and IEEE 802.3 AT. All of those indicate compatibility with the TSM-14. One other important thing to keep in mind when selecting a switch is something called a power budget. Essentially, the power budget for a, a PoE connections is the sum of the power requirements for all of those PoE devices that you're going to use on the switch. In the case of the And that's because this motor is designed to max out the power available from the PoE Plus standard. So, for example, if you were planning to use three TSM-14 motors in your application, you would allocate 90 watts total of your power budget to power these motors. When researching switch specific specifications in preparation for today, I found a couple of examples that I thought would be good to include here for the purposes of illustration. In both of these examples, the text in quotes is copied almost verbatim from the manufacturer's documentation for their products. The first example reads, 12 port industrial PoE plus managed ethernet switch with eight ethernet ports that support IEEE 802.3 AT for a maximum of 30 watts per port. That's perfect. It nails every one of the identifiers that we have. Um, and because it says the ports, uh, eight ports at a maximum of 30 watts per port, that means you can use all eight ports 
with 30 watts each concurrently, and that would translate to using uh, up to eight TSM-14 POEs on that one switch. In the second example, it's also an eight POE plus port switch, but you can see it has a total POE system budget of 120 watts. So that means everything you're going to connect to this switch can't draw more than 120 watts. Well, that only translates to four max maximum TSM-14 POEs and not giving you any budget left over for any other devices. So two, P two, two switches, excuse me, with eight POE plus ports, but very different power budgets. So that is uh, something just, it's, it's just the way it is, and it's something you want to be aware of when uh, diving into POE if you're not already in it. One topic that comes up pretty regularly with the TSM-14 is homing. Um, this comes up because these motors don't have any digital inputs for connecting a home sensor, which is typically how we do this. But fortunately, we've got a few straightforward approaches to homing the motor, with the first one being continuing to use a wired home sensor. Um, here, you would wire the home sensor to your PLC or Ethernet controller, though, instead of directly to the motor. And then the PLC or Ethernet controller will sig signal the motor to stop by sending an Ethernet command to it to stop when the home sensor has been detected. Then the motor stops, um, but there's likely going to be some small delay or lag that will occur between the sensor being detected and the stop command being executed at the motor. And so this by itself may not provide the most accurate home position. Some applications it will be enough and others it will not. So as a best practice, what we recommend is to follow that initial, let's call it a rough home position with a subsequent homing position that moves to the motor's index channel on its encoder. So the index channel on its encoder is, is of course coming directly from the motor and it's uh, coupled directly to the shaft. So this provides a very precise and repeatable home position and this approach, home sensor to the PLC or controller followed by uh, home to the index channel is going to work for most applications. The second approach is to utilize hard stop homing. In this case, we don't have uh, a home sensor. Instead, we have a physical mechanical stop that's built into the system. And that mechanical stop is specific, specifically designed for the motor or part of the uh, actuator to bump into it in a controlled fashion. So during the homing run, the motor current is reduced to limit the force of that bump, and the speed of the motor is set to be slow. So reduced current move ensures that we safely bump into the hard stop and that the motor can easily detect that bump. And then after that, the motor automatically backs up away from the stop or the bump a fixed distance or offset. And that final resting position is the home position. And for applications that require maybe another layer of precision, just like the previous example, you can do a subsequent homing run to the motor's index channel. And then finally, uh, these, this last uh, commentary is for single turn uh, applications. What that means, the entire range of motion for the application fits within 360 degrees of the motor. For these applications, simply homing to the motor's index channel is typically a very good option. Home to the index channel, and then you can move an offset if you need to uh, off of the index channel to get to your home position. Um, but for some applications, a single turn absolute encoder signal would be a better solution. And for those applications, we do offer a customization for this motor where we convert the encoder from incremental to single turn absolute. And we can do this because of the inherent capabilities of the magnetic encoder used on these motors. Um, they have inherent absolute positioning capabilities that we don't use in the standard product, but we can make available to you if you need it. So we would love to be able to provide that. Uh, functionality for you if you can benefit from it. So be sure to contact us if you'd uh, like to look into that. Another usage consideration is cabling and connectors. 
Uh, most switch manufacturers specify 100 meters max length on the Ethernet cable, and we recommend the same. Uh, we also recommend using CAT6 cable, which is preferred because it provides uh, lower cable resistance than CAT5. Um, really, you can get away with CAT5, CAT6, CAT7, higher, uh, but um, CAT6 is a, is a good go-to if you um, are unsure. RJ45 cables are going to be the easiest to source, of course, because we've probably all got one in our computer bag right now or somewhere in our office um, or home. Uh, while M12 connectors are and cables are offer inherent strain relief and just an overall more rugged connection. So we realize that M12 cables aren't quite as common. So we offer a standard flex M12 to RJ45 cable uh, as an accessory to our motor. And this cable is perfect for both uh, configuring the motor during startup as well as being part of your permanent installation. And then lastly, I'd like to note that high-flex uh, Ethernet cables are available on the market for those who need it. So if you don't have a source for uh, M12 cable, we, we offer one as an accessory. Um, otherwise, they're easy to source online. Another common question we, uh, or series of questions we get relate to the LEDs in the rotary switch on the back of the motor. So let me explain a little bit about that. Um, the, most Ethernet devices will have Ethernet link and activity LEDs. Um, the RJ45 version of our motor has the link and activity LEDs built right into the RJ45 connector with an amber light for link and a green light for activity. This is just like the Ethernet connector on your computer or uh, other Ethernet devices. The M12 connector, however, does not have these built-in LEDs. So what we've done is um, there are there are two LEDs on the back edge of the motor, and we've dedicated one of those two to Ethernet activity. So you can see it circled here in the picture on the right. This is the activity uh, LED for the Ethernet connection on the M12 version, and um, there is no link, there is no amber link LED on the M12 version. The other LED that's used, uh, uh, or on the back edge of the motors, is used as a status code LED. This is a combination red and green LED that tells you whether or not there's an alarm or fault present with the motor. Uh, basically, if there are any red flashes of this LED, it means an alarm or fault is present. Uh, you can see the table on the right shows all the different codes. So the exact uh, pattern of red and green flashes is what indicates the specific alarm or fault that's present. And then the rotary switch. The rotary switch on the back of the motor is for setting the IP address. It's a 16 position rotary switch where position zero is fixed to the address 10, 10, 10, 10. Uh, you can think of this address as the default or the recovery address because no matter the situation with your motor, you can always return to switch position zero and know with confidence what the motor's IP address is. Uh, this is also the most common address to use when unboxing the motor and setting it up for the first time. Uh, switch position F is fixed to DHCP for applications that work with a router to automatically assign IP addresses to devices on the network. And then switch positions 1 through E are preset at the factory as shown in this table, but these can be um, changed to your liking during software configuration. So you can program these 14 positions to specific IP addresses on the subnet of your choice, and then choose between those addresses later based on your needs by simply using the rotary switch. Uh, configuration of the TSM-14 is done using the Step Servo Quick Tuner software, which is the same software used for all Step Servo integrated motors and drives. You can download it for free from our website and you'll find it under the products menu by clicking on software. And for my last slide, I'd like to highlight additional resources that are available on our website. You'll find all of the relevant information for these products on the product pages that include specifications, torque curves, uh, documentation such as manual, quick setup guide, drawings, various application notes, and 
presentation, I'll include more resources for you in the follow-up email I send after the webinar. So hopefully I hit something uh, uh, of value for you there in that presentation. Thank you everyone for attending. We can now open it up for questions. Yeah, thanks Eric, that was a great presentation. Um, we are a little bit short on time today, but I do want to highlight a couple questions that have come in while we have everyone here, as they seem to be fairly common. So just as a reminder, if you have a question, go ahead and submit it in the question box in the webinar control panel, and we can follow up on anything we don't get to after the webinar is over. So Eric, I want to go back to um, kind of switches and power for a minute here. You know, there's other mm -hmm. PoE standards besides this PoE plus 30 watts. So can you mix and match, you know, can you use higher power switches with our PoE plus motors? Yeah, definitely. So you're talking, um, or this question I think is referring to like ultra PoE or uh, four pair PoE that support like 60 watts, 90 watts or higher. Um, yeah, this is one of the really nice things about PoE is that it's, uh, because it's an IEEE standard, it's um, it's got a, it's very robust, and anybody who adheres to the standard basically gives plug and play interoperability between their devices. So, if you connect a PoE Plus device like our motor, which is just developed for 30 watts, into say an ultra PoE uh, port that provides more than, that is able to provide more than 30 watts, the switch will. Uh, negotiate with our motor with the device uh, at power up when it first detects our device and determine what its actual uh, power requirements are and then it will only provide it with those power requirements so in this case 30 watts and it goes the same for even non-poe devices as well if you have a switch uh, in your system and the only thing available is a poe port but the device you're connecting is not poe that's fine too the the switch will will automatically determine whether or not to supply power to the device and uh, so you don't even have to think about it. So it's very transparent and uh, the only thing you need to be aware of is that you, you the, the port that you're connecting to has to have at least the minimum power available that you need. If it has more, it's going to be transparent and no problem. Okay, thanks. And um, can I use this with Ethernet IP? Yes, definitely. Uh, so this, um, our Ethernet IP implementation is quite robust. We have add-on instructions available for uh, Rockwell controllers, uh, Studio 5000 software. We also have a number of customers that are using non-Rockwell, non-Allen Bradley controllers uh, like Omron um, and other manufacturers. And uh, our stuff is conformant to the ODVA standard. And so, absolutely, you can you can use our products with Ethernet IP, including this motor. Okay, thanks. Um, that's about all we have time for today. If you do have additional questions, please submit them via email or contact us on the website. This presentation will be available on our YouTube channel in a couple of days, and there'll be a survey going out shortly. It's a quick survey, less than a minute, and we do appreciate your feedback. And thanks again for your time today. Have a great rest of your day.